Hello, science people. Today, I want to talk about DNA replication. But before I do that, I kind of want to talk about a philosophical issue that comes up with teaching biology, especially teaching freshman biology. A lot of times I struggle with and I ask myself, is it really important for students to know this? I love biology. I study biology. I love every aspect of it. But does every citizen need to know every aspect of biology? Probably not. Will my students remember every aspect of biology? No, definitely not. And DNA replication is one of those topics that I struggle with a little bit. So why would we need to know what's going to come up? The replication bubble. The replication bubble is DNA getting unzipped, all of these enzymes coming in and starting to create a daughter strand compared to a parent strand and unzipping and getting two strands of DNA. Now, I go into detail with all of the enzymes and how this process takes place. But every year when I do this, I question, do my students need to know this entire process and how much emphasis should I put on it? Most students would be totally fine just knowing that DNA gets unzipped by enzymes and now we have two copies of DNA. Great. So why go into a replication bubble with all of these enzymes? And so this is what I use to justify teaching the replication bubble. In order to understand mutations and evolution and some genetic disorders, it helps if we understand how DNA is copied. And so by going into the replication bubble and talking about how DNA is copied and how DNA is created, we can then better understand how mistakes in DNA happen and how mistakes in DNA get created. So if you knew how the nucleotides were placed, what enzymes place them, then you better understand when I talk about mutations and how a nucleotide substitution happened or how a missed nucleotide, a nucleotide deletion happens. And so understanding the process of creating DNA will help us understand really important topics like mutations. And evolution is based on mutations. So alleles, differences in genes, those all come about because of mutations. And so I think understanding how DNA is created, how it is replicated, we better understand those things. We even can better understand cancer and other diseases that plague us because we can see where replicating your DNA, where the damages can take place. So that being said, I still do struggle with how much detail should I go into with the replication bubble and with DNA replication, because how important is this to the lives of my students when they go off to be young citizens? And so I think it is important to understand mutations and evolution, but I don't think it's so important in freshman biology that we have to go into extreme detail. Well, that being said, let's jump into the whiteboard. Okay, so let's talk about the replication bubble and how DNA is replicated. So I apologize for my terrible art skills. I am a science teacher, not an art teacher. But here's my DNA in its double helix form. And double helixes are pretty hard to draw. All right, so here's my DNA. We cannot replicate DNA in its double helix form. It has to be opened up. You have to separate the double strands. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have enzymes that do this entire process. And so let's start drawing our replication bubble. And so we have our first enzyme. The first enzyme that starts is called DNA helicase. So we have DNA helicase. And if it ends in ACE, remember, that's how we know it's an enzyme. And so DNA helicase unzips the DNA. It's going to separate the double strands. And so this DNA helicase is going in this direction. And so what's going to happen is we have our DNA separated, the top strand and the bottom strand. And so we have all of our nucleotides that are all on these two strands. And remember, they're base pairs. They match up. And so if, like, you had an adenine here, you'd have a thymine here, 
you have a guanine here, you would have a cytosine here. And so all the base pairs are there, they all match up, they're just separated because DNA helicase unzip the DNA. And so that's what starts this process. We then have an enzyme that is called primase. So primase sets an RNA primer. So let's say that it put a primer here. And so it's going to build this little RNA primer. Well, the RNA primer tells this big enzyme DNA polymerase where to start. And so this enzyme is called DNA polymerase. And so if you remember, a polymer is a long macromolecule. And so a polymerase is an, is an enzyme that makes a polymer. Okay, so DNA polymerase is what builds DNA. These are the most important enzymes in this process because they're going to make the DNA. And so primase laid down that primer, letting DNA polymerase know where to start. And so this DNA polymerase is going to follow DNA helicase. And what it's going to do is, let's say that there was an adenine here, it'll put a thymine here. There was a guanine here, it'll put a cytosine here. If there was a thymine here, it'll put an adenine here. And so what it's going to do is, it's going to start building a new strand of DNA following the DNA helicase as it unzips. Now, because the red one that I drew, the primer's RNA, it'll eventually have to get replaced. Let's say that this was A, T, C. Because it's RNA, there is no thymine. And so instead of a T here, there's a U, there's an A, and there's a G. Now that RNA will eventually have to be removed. And so what's gonna happen is there's gonna be another DNA polymerase that will come remove that RNA later. And then we're gonna have a little enzyme called ligase, and ligase is gonna come and stitch that new removed primer to that new daughter strand. And so, and so that DNA polymerase is gonna to continue to follow helicase and creating this new strand that we're gonna call the daughter strand. So the original strand is called the parent strand, and this new strand is called the daughter strand. And the same thing is happening on this bottom DNA strand. We have a DNA polymerase that is going this way because DNA actually has a direction. We have a three prime to five prime direction and that's because of the orientation of the carbons. But I wanna to focus today just on the replication bubble. And so this DNA polymerase is building a new daughter strand in this direction. And so it's gonna just keep laying down new nucleotides that match the base pair of the bottom parent strand. And so this means that this is a bubble. And so there's another side of the DNA over here. And that means on this side, there is also a DNA helicase going that direction. And so what's gonna happen is both these DNA helicases are gonna keep unzipping the DNA. The DNA polymerases are gonna keep building the new daughter strand in both directions until the DNA strand is completely unzipped. And we're gonna have two complete DNA strands. And so you're gonna have a parent strand and you're gonna have a daughter strand for both pieces of DNA. And so this is important. We call this semi-conservative replication because you don't have a new strand of DNA and an old strand. Instead, you now have two strands that both have an old strand and both have a new strand. So you're semi-conservative. You're saving the old strand on both of them. Now, why would that be important? What are the benefits to that? Well, it helps us prevent mistakes in our DNA. And the reason we do that is because we could always check this daughter strand with the parent strand. We can compare them. And so if you had just two brand new daughter strands, maybe there was a mistake, maybe there wasn't, there's not really an old strand to compare it to. So having a semi-conservative replication gives us an extra way to kind of spell check our DNA.
And so this is going to continue, and this is happening during the S phase, the synthesis phase of DNA replication. And then later, the cell will go into mitosis, where it'll then start to divide, but it already now has copied all of its DNA using the DNA replication bubble process. And we talk about this, again, because I can now really point out to my students, well, what happens if there's an adenine here and there should be a thymine placed on top, but instead a cytosine is placed? And so understanding this replication process will help us later talk about mutations and how they come about. And then even later when we talk about viruses and we talk about viruses that use RNA that are single-stranded and how they mutate so fast. So being able to understand this process will help us with that. So there are more enzymes in this. We can go into a lot more detail, but the most important enzymes in this process are gonna be DNA helicase, which unzips the DNA, DNA polymerase, which builds the DNA strand. It's building the new DNA strand. We have primase, which sets the primers, which tell DNA polymerase where to start. And then we have ligase, which goes in and stitches the replaced primers. It just connects the new DNA to that replaced primer. And so there's lots of DNA polymerases as well. Um, sometimes they call them DNA polymerase 3, 2, and 1. And DNA polymerase 3 would be that top one that is building the DNA. And then we have a DNA polymerase 1 that goes and replaces the RNA primers. And then we have a DNA polymerase 2 that kind of goes around spell checking everything. But I think the most important, important parts is to know helicase unzips, polymerase is what's building the DNA, primase sets down those primers, and ligase is going to be what stitches the new DNA together. And then there's even some other enzymes like topoisomerase, which help hold the DNA from breaking or straightening it out. And then we have things like Okazaki fragments, which means that this bottom DNA polymerase is going to be building things in fragments. But I think the most important part is just understanding that this replication bubble is taking place that we're building these new daughter strands and the process in which we do it. All right, everybody, thank you, and I will see you next time.